You ever try to assemble a piece of furniture without bothering to look at the instructions? You know, you just shoot from the hip and slap it all together according to what your idea of a six drawer bedroom dresser should look like? Well, that dresser, the one with the chunks of particle board missing where you tried to pry out fasteners with a couple of drawers that don't open because you screwed the runners in backwards, is the helplessly crooked 1976 Atlanta Falcons. You couldn't have set a pencil on top of them without it rolling off the side. This team sent several distress signals, the strongest of which was a Week 7 encounter in San Francisco. Early on in this one, Falcons punter John James set up to punt the ball away deep in his own territory. Botched punts sometimes result in safeties, but I don't know if I've ever seen a snap fly so far over the punter's head that it might have actually sailed through the uprights. The official play-by-play -play describes what we're seeing here as ball centered out of end zone. Google that phrase and you'll mostly find high school games. But that wasn't even the half of it. The Falcons would have been better off if their passing game simply didn't work that night. It was worse than that. They threw for a grand total of 46 yards, which for starters is beyond pitiful. Thing is, their quarterbacks were sacked eight times for a total loss of 85 yards. That meant their passing game netted negative 39 yards. Whenever they drop back to throw, they averaged about negative one yard per play. I won't blame the players for this. It all came from the top. After owner Rankin Smith fired Norm Van Brocklin in 74, he elevated assistant Marion Campbell to the top job. After the Falcons suffered a second free fall, general manager Pat Pepler insisted to Smith that they couldn't wait, that they had to fire Campbell midseason. Okay, Smith said, you're the coach now. Pepler, who had never coached football above the high school level, didn't want to be the coach. Too bad. He was now both general manager and head coach. After some more losing, during which he openly told the press he felt like he was being set up, he was fired from both his jobs. The Atlanta Falcons were in desperate need of leadership. And they did what should always be done, when the moment requires a fearless leader, a great conqueror to lead the way to victory. They found a Kentuckian. Paducah, Kentucky's own Lehman Bennett had spent the last few years with a Rams team that had done a lot of winning. Like all Kentuckians, he was a famously chilled out person who everyone liked and thought was cool. Unlike the galactically cranky Van Brocklin and the rabble of unhappy overwhelmed coaches that came before him and after him, Bennett seemed completely comfortable in his role and he wanted his players to be happy in theirs. In insisting on a five-year deal as the NFL's youngest coach, he demonstrated his ambition but also his pragmatism. Unlike most modern NFL teams, he understood that a coach needs time to win without worrying the axe could fall at any second. In his first year, Coach Bennett started delivering with a 7-7 record that, at this point, the organization was more than happy with. Remarkably, he did this with really underwhelming production on the offensive side of the ball. Here we see the average points per game scored by every team in the post-merger era. The 77 Falcons are down here, having averaged a shade under 13 points per game. Pretty weak. Now, let's look at how many points they allowed on the other side of the ball. In terms of points allowed, the 1977 Falcons fielded the best defense of the last 50 years. No, really. It was a year in which, especially at the outset, it was like they were facing high school offenses. Through the first five games of the season, they allowed just 22 points, an impossibly low 4.4 per game. 23 years later, over in that weird baseball sport, a fellow by the name of Andy Pettit had an ERA of 4.35. More than a third of the way through the 1977 season, the Falcons were allowing roughly the same amount of points per game as the ERA of a guy who is at the front end of a World Series winning starting pitcher rotation. You know what, let's stay on baseball for just a minute. Remember that the Falcons and Braves were roommates sharing the field at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Here's the points slash runs they gave up on that field in 77. All seven Falcons home games are in here, as is every Braves home game. Here's a fun one. Can you guess which ones belong to the Falcons? You're probably wrong. The Falcons actually look like they belong on this chart, despite, you know, the fact that football typically produces way, way more points than baseball. In fact, it was the Braves, who gave up 23 runs in a game in April, who made the worst defensive stand on this field. I'm not sure which team that says more about. 1977 marked the final year before the NFL expanded the regular season schedule to 16 games per club. But in the swan song of that archaic length, it was still long enough for the Falcons to sneak in 10 games in which they allowed no more than 10 points. 
They had by far the league's stingiest defense, and the focal point around whom everything revolved was their legendary Hall of Fame defensive end, Claude Humphrey. Initially, however, it appeared they may not have him to spearhead this unit. A year earlier, in 1976, a few things had soured him on the organization. One was the mid-season firing of Marion Campbell, who'd been a mentor for years and someone who Humphrey felt extreme loyalty toward. That was just salt on the wound after they'd traded away his pass-rushing partner in crime, John Zook, which took a huge physical and emotional toll on him. Nevertheless, at age 32 and coming off torn knee ligaments, Humphrey dominated in his return to the field. The 10-year vet didn't want to spend the twilight to his career without a chance to contend for a championship. So Humphrey asked to be traded. It seemed inevitable that the team would be parting ways with arguably the greatest player they'd ever had. They couldn't have known how fortunate they were at the time, but ultimately, after a series of meetings, they resolved their differences and welcomed Humphrey back to the team early in training camp to lead what would become a historic defensive juggernaut. Secondary coach Jerry Glanville was the architect and de facto coordinator of the unit, which was nicknamed the Grits Blitz by a bread delivery guy, according to Glanville. As the name implies, the unorthodox scheme was predicated around overwhelming the offense by flooding the box and dialing up every pressure package imaginable without ever fearing the potential repercussions. Take this week three play against the Giants. It's a second and 30 when New York calls a screen to try and neutralize Atlanta's relentless pass rush. That relentless pass rush couldn't care less. Glanville crowds the line of scrimmage, unleashing no fewer than seven Falcons after a quarterback who has to pick up a mile for a first down. Even though they're exposed to a big play if that screen gets lofted up there with enough air under it, the immediacy with which the Falcons rush gets home renders that moot and they bat the ball away. That is the kind of destruction the grit splits inflicted on a weekly basis. Individually, Humphrey was an all-timer, and for a while, cornerback Rollin Lawrence was an interception machine. But as Glanville eloquently explained, overall, this was a defense where the whole far exceeded the sum of the parts. None of the league's offensive coordinators were able to figure out the antidote for a defense simply bringing virtually the entire house on virtually every play. If you think I'm exaggerating, in the first game of the season against the Rams, their defense ran 54 plays. Glanville blitzed both safeties on 46 of them. Double safety blitzes over 85% of the time. Eventually, Chargers coach Don Coriel neutered this defensive philosophy with the brilliant idea to adjust his blocking scheme and attack all those juicy one-on-one -on -one matchups downfield. And because of that, the 77 Falcons defense was a flash in the pan. Mediocre before Glanville arrived, and with the book out on how to make his strategy backfire, mediocre after. So, no, the Falcons did not deliver a defensive performance that was anywhere near as good in 1978. You know what they did do? They went to the playoffs. Yeah. Again, lest you think this is the story of a perennial loser, a team that never went anywhere or did anything, you should know that the Atlanta Falcons have fielded a lot of playoff teams. This was their first, and definitely not their best. This was a team that allowed 50 more points than it scored across the season. In terms of point differential, the eight teams to make the playoffs that season were the six best teams, the middle of the pack Vikings, and these Falcons who ranked 24th of 28. This is, and always has been, a great way to make everyone in the NFL mad at you. Everybody was talking shit. After the 1-12 Bengals beat them 37-7 in week 14, one Bengal said there was no way the team they just blew to pieces was going to the playoffs. A week later, when the Falcons squeaked one out over Washington on the final play, quarterback Joe Theismann said they were completely undeserving. You know what? I get where they were coming from. Generally speaking, this was not a very good team. To make the postseason, they needed a springboard, and they found it in the New Orleans Saints, who were more mad at the Falcons than anyone. The Saints' Ralph McGill was heated. They all were. They ain't better than the Saints, he said. Not on the field, not on paper. I take no pleasure in reporting this. 
The Saints couldn't win for losing. It's all they ever did. Entering this season, the Falcons had beaten them often, going 12-6 all-time against them, and they'd beaten them badly, outscoring them 415 points to 273. But in 1978, they found more elegant ways to devastate them. This was the year Falcons vs. Saints began to escalate from one-sided regional feud into arguably the most hot-blooded rivalry ever seen in professional American sports. They first met in the Superdome, the Saints' brand new space-age facility that, you know, they didn't have to share with a baseball team. This was really the only thing the Saints could hold over the Falcons, but in week 11, they were looking for more. For the first time in their 12-year history, the Saints were not terrible. They even had an outside shot at the playoffs, heading into this one at 5-5. Five and five. And with just 10 seconds left in the ball game, they held a 17-13 lead over Atlanta. The Falcons have the ball at their own 43-yard line, in one last shot. Down by four, a field goal is no good. They gotta go for six. We have data stretching back to 1994 detailing every time a team has run a play from their own territory while trailing within the final 10 seconds of a game. There have been 716 such attempts. Five have resulted in touchdowns. The Falcons are attempting football's Kobayashi Maru, a puzzle solved by almost no one. There is no such thing as a winning strategy here. You just have to throw it as far as you can and hope it breaks something. In this moment, the Falcons need a quarterback who can win a game with his arm. They've never had one. All they've ever had is a platoon of guys who were shoved out there to stare down the terrifying NFL defenses of the 1960s and 70s and do the best they could. But this Sunday, they're seeing the emergence of their first great field general. Steve Bartkowski had taken a few years to find his footing. If he'd been drafted by any other team, he might have been able to take a year or two to serve as backup and learn the ropes, but no team was as desperate for a quarterback as the Falcons, who drafted him first overall and immediately put him on active duty. After a rough rookie season in 1975, his play seriously regressed in 76 and 77. They called him Peachtree Bart, named after the street where he was seen partying every night. He threw more interceptions than touchdowns, but the simple fact that he wasn't afraid to throw deep and go for broke made him a fan favorite. There is more than one Peachtree Street, though, and there was more than one Bart. When he learned that yet another injury required season-ending surgery, he walked out of the hospital, wandered the city, and cried for hours. In just a few years, he'd fallen from college superstar to seriously underwhelming party boy, frequently injured and in the process of flaming out. And then he found the Lord. Although he went undrafted out of Nazareth, Jesus Christ has been credited as the driving force behind many Super Bowl victories. Was he really? I don't know. But if you're telling a story about the South, there's no way he can be left out. Evangelical Christianity was really taking hold in America in this time, especially here. It was an interpretation that stood apart from the fire and brimstone type that had dominated the South for so long. Instead, it emphasized love, a promise of a personal relationship with the one who created you. In a time when technology and culture were changing at staggering rates, the economy was crashing, and the state rattled your cage every couple years with warnings that Fidel Castro was in a missile silo somewhere staring at a big red button that said, I don't know, Ackworth, Georgia on it, it's certainly very easy to empathize. It's even easier in the case of a quarterback who's watching his dreams fall apart. Many in the Falcons' locker room were religious, but veteran linebacker Greg Brzezina was perhaps the biggest evangelical influence. He witnessed to Bartkowski, and after a brutal preseason outing in 78 that ended up with him getting booed out of Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, he prayed the prayer. Now, I imagine that even he would tell you that his stats didn't improve because God favored him, but whatever reason you chalk it up to, Bart's numbers made a complete turnaround after that. After injuries contributed to an almost unthinkably bad 1977, he rebounded dramatically and actually went on to become one of the best quarterbacks in football for a time. Back to the Superdome. Bart has a cannon for an arm and represents the Falcons' best chance to pull off the near impossible. He hurls it into the deep. His target, receiver Wallace Francis, runs right into the Saints' prevent defense, and the pass is broken up. In today's NFL, defenders are taught to swat down the ball in this situation rather than going for the interception, and there is a reason for that. In going for the ball, the Saints inadvertently punch it back up into the air and right into the hands of rookie wideout Alfred Jackson, who takes it in for the game-winning touchdown. He's done it. Bart believes in Bart. And maybe God believes in Bart, too. The Falcons allowed the Saints to believe they were legitimate contenders for a couple hours, and then they slammed the door shut. 
Two emotions in football are sad and mad, and having accomplished the former, the Falcons pushed the latter button in Week 13. It was a reversal of their first ever meeting in 1967, in which the Falcons saw their game-sealing interception erased by a pass interference call. Eleven years later, an intercepted Steve Barkowski throw should have ended the game, but didn't, thanks to a pass interference call that... Well, they didn't show it in any game recaps, and I think there's a reason for that. It was such a poor piece of officiating that, after the season, NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle reviewed it and singled it out as the wrong call. This was the year the Falcons and Saints genuinely started hating each other. In the 40 plus years since, sometimes both teams have been very good. Sometimes one has been bad, sometimes both have been bad. None of that has mattered. The temperature has never dropped from this point. But in the short term, this stolen win meant yet another losing record for the Saints and the first ever playoff appearance for the Atlanta Falcons. Atlanta welcomed the Eagles to town on Christmas Eve, where neither team seems a strong threat to make a deep playoff run. Near the end of the first quarter, the Eagles strike first when quarterback Ron Jaworski hits Pro Bowl wideout Harold Carmichael to take a 6-0 lead. On to kick the extra point trots out Philly's punter after coach Dick Vermeil decided to plot place kicking duties onto Mike Michel in the wake of an injury to their kicker a month earlier. Even though Vermeil couldn't have had much faith in him, the Eagles didn't even attempt a single field goal in any of their final four regular season games since Michel took over double duty, though he did miss an extra point in three straight games coming into this one. Now make it four straight to keep the score at 6-0 quick break in the action to reiterate that the Eagles absolutely do not have to live this way. They've had an entire month to sign a full-time kicker. This is something that NFL teams do all the time. I mean, the Falcons themselves just did it. They literally went to Philadelphia, the city the Philadelphia Eagles are from, and signed a guy out of a bar. But instead, Dick Vermeil just has his punter moonlighting as a kicker, clearly knowing full well that Michelle is not up to the job. Why? We tried to dig for some kind of explanation for this. We just do not know. Philly maintains that lead until midway through the third quarter, when their star running back Wilbert Montgomery breaks the plane of the goal line from a yard out. Despite a penalty pushing their point after try back and Michelle losing his footing, this partially deflected kick finds its way home to put the Eagles up 13-0. With the third quarter winding down and Atlanta still shut out, Michel gets a chance to attempt the very first field goal of his career. It would put his team up three scores with less than 18 minutes to play. The 42-yarder comes up short and wide. He also falls again. It's almost like the Eagles would be better off with a kicker as their kicker. With the Falcons still trailing 13-0, thoroughly confounded by the Eagles' Marion Campbell coordinated defense, and under 10 minutes left to play, Barkowski starts pressing to make something happen. He heaves up this prayer to a double-covered Alfred Jackson that Philly's Bobby Howard easily picks off and returns into what for many teams is field goal range. When Jaworski converts this third and seven into a fresh set of downs in the red zone with eight minutes and change left, the Falcons can just about taste their off-season vacation plans. And then, on the very next play, the Eagles fumble, with Falcons linebacker Fulton Kuykendall recovering the loose ball. All of a sudden, 
Atlanta has a shred of hope. Three plays later, that hope grows with this spectacular catch that Wallace Francis rips away from safety John Sanders. Then on a third and 15, Bartkowski connects with tight end Jim Mitchell for the touchdown as the Falcons cut the deficit to six with just under five minutes remaining. It's now their defense's turn to again step up and they force a quick three and out to hand the ball back to Bartkowski at midfield with three minutes on the clock and the team needing a touchdown to have any chance to move on to Dallas the following week. With a holding penalty leading to another third and long, Barkowski again looks toward Francis, who's flying up the seam wide open to haul in the game-tying pass. The ever-important extra point gets banged through by former Eagle Mazzetti. The Falcons have somehow taken the lead, but there's still 139 to go. The defense has to make one last stop. And after the Eagles reach Falcon territory, Jerry Glanville just can't help himself from dialing up an ultra-aggressive blitz, which comes this close to handing Philly the game on a silver platter. The Eagles eventually get all the way down to the Falcons' 16-yard line, and after a couple incompletions bring the clock down to 17 seconds, Vermeil decides on third down to call on his acting kicker, who has never made a field goal or even remained upright after trying. Just a couple weeks prior, some of the Eagles players went to a Neil Diamond show. Knowing this, Neil stopped in the middle of the set and invited the Eagles to come up on stage and sing a song with him. Ron Jaworski, the star quarterback sitting up close, got stage fright, but Mike Michelle, sitting way up in the cheap seats a kicker's pay will typically get you, was beside himself. He was so excited to get up there and sing with Neil, but he was too far away, and he just couldn't get there in time. This time, it's Jaworski who couldn't make it all the way up there. And this time, Mike Michelle has made it on stage. With the entire stadium holding their breath, Michelle's kick heads straight toward the right upright, a good initial sign considering his kicks usually hook to the left, but this one stays straight, sailing just wide to the right. The Atlanta Falcons have survived and advanced. In a game that came down to a couple kickers not far removed from being employed as something other than kickers, the one who opened the season as a bartender hit what turned out to be the game-winning extra point because the one who opened the season as a punter missed a first quarter extra point, a third quarter field goal, and a last second would-be game-winning field goal from a distance that's generally considered a chip shot as long as it's not attempted by a punter. Atlanta Fulton County Stadium is in chaos. There are still 13 seconds left, but Falcons fans don't care. They're storming the field and mobbing Barkowski. It takes about five full minutes for officials to restore order. Lost in the mob is Mike Michelle, who fell to the ground after missing the kick, staring downward and oblivious of everything happening around him. He's invisible to everyone, except Greg Brezina. Without even an instant of hesitation or celebration, he goes right over to Michelle and shares the word of Christ with him. Later, Rosina will say that he's not sure Michelle even noticed him, but Michelle will confirm that he heard every last word. This shot is a cinematic masterstroke on the part of the CBS camera operator who's catching it. Though they couldn't know it in the moment, they were documenting one of the very most Atlanta things that has ever happened.
Going into their matchup with the defending Super Bowl champions, no one was giving the Falcons a chance in hell. Even Lehman Bennett acknowledged that the Cowboys were simply on another level, and that the Falcons didn't even have the athletes to compete with Dallas. His rousing mantra all throughout the week was that you never can tell what will happen, and, well, you never know. Barkowski didn't project much more confidence than his coach either, as his squad was one of the biggest underdogs in NFL postseason history, and for good reason. Atlanta was headed to Dallas to face a Cowboys offense that scored far and away the most points in the conference, and a defense that allowed far and away the fewest, with their point differential towering over the field. An unpleasant task for the squad down at negative 50 to try and topple. But come kickoff time, it didn't take long for the Falcons to start shocking even themselves. The first time the Falcons get the ball, they go right down the field, capping the drive with fullback Bubba Bean finding the end zone on this draw play to take an early 7-3 lead. The defense then holds strong to force punter Danny White on the field, only for him to spontaneously keep the ball and convert a fourth and long to steal a possession from Atlanta. The Cowboys capitalize, punctuating their drive's second life with a touchdown to answer back. After trading field goals, the Falcons retake the lead late in the second quarter as that Barkowski-Francis connection stays sizzling. Got his man! Touchdown, Wallace Francis! Touchbacks are a pretty routine part of football, and on the ensuing kickoff, we see an example of your standard touchback. Nothing to see here. Yeah, no nothing, just the ball bouncing off the kick returner, then apparently into the hands of Tom Pridemore, who, by the way, will soon serve as a sitting member of the West Virginia House of Delegates while still actively playing for the Falcons. Only time that's happened, I think. Anyway, it's popped loose from Pridemore and Ernie Jackson falls on it. The play sure appears to be over here, as the Cowboy's leg is touching him while he's on the ground, but the refs let it play out long enough for the Cowboy's Pat Donovan to punch it out. Bruce Huther chases it down, gets his mitts on it here, and then rolls into the end zone. The official is right there, in perfect position to witness what is obviously a safety, but nope. It's ruled a touchback, and the Cowboys keep the ball. Dallas just caught two enormous breaks in the space of three seconds. Complain about modern officiating all you want, but it used to be a million times worse. About 63 real-time seconds later, this Tony Dorsett fumble leads to another Atlanta field goal. Then the Cowboys lose their quarterback when Roger Staubach, arguably the NFL's top signal caller, suffers a concussion on a hit from Falcons linebacker Robert Pennywell. So again, we see the Falcons' playoff opponent shift their punter to another position. Though at least here, White had actually, you know, played this position extensively throughout his life and legitimately doubles as his team's backup quarterback. But the Cowboys are reeling as the game heads to halftime with David up 7 over Goliath. Midway through the third quarter, White finds tight end Jackie Smith for the score to tie the game at 20. And with a little under 10 minutes left in the game, they take the lead on this one-yard touchdown plunge. The Falcons, stuck in mud offensively all half, finally get a drive going late to potentially tie the game, but with just three minutes remaining, they're faced with fourth and a foot at the Dallas 32, and they come up just short. They do get the ball one final time, but with only 40 seconds left, star safety Cliff Harris sticks the dagger in Atlanta, who put up a fight far greater than just about anyone could have imagined, but ultimately see their magical postseason run end in agonizing fashion. Well, time to find someone to take it out on. 1979 was an off year for the Falcons. At 6-10, and 10, they finished behind the Saints, who would have had their first ever winning record, were it not for Atlanta finding a weird way to beat them on the final play for a third consecutive game. They're going to overtime in the season opener. Near midfield, the Saints' Russell Erksleben lines up to punt when the snap flies over his head. His only move left is to scoop it up and try to throw it. 
Asking a punter to make an emergency pass is kind of like handing a paintbrush to an elephant. It's just interesting to see what they create. Now in today's NFL, he'd be allowed to just throw it away since he's out of the tackle box. That exception is not on the books in 1979, so he actually has to throw it to somebody. And he does. Falcons win. Adding insult to insult, the paint on which the Falcons' James Mayberry spikes the ball isn't even the Saints. It's Tulane University's. They're taking the backseat to a college team in their own stadium. This was Atlanta's biggest highlight in what turned out to be a down year, but these were still the Falcons of Lehman and Bart. And in 1980, they won like they never had before. Jerry Glanville, now promoted to defensive coordinator, oversaw an aggressive, opportunistic defense that ranked among the league's best. So did the offense, thanks largely to Bartkowski emerging as one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. It culminated in a 12-4 season, far and away the best in Falcons history. They clowned the Saints in both meetings by a combined score of 72-27 on their way to ripping off nine straight wins. By the end of it, they were ready to walk around in public and say the words Super Bowl out loud. Nobody was laughing. They actually had the league's respect now. But the NFL has always been a league of dynasties, gatekeepers that ward off undesirables like the Falcons. By 1980, there had been 14 Super Bowls, meaning that if invites had been evenly distributed, all 28 teams would have been able to play in one. You would never expect that level of parity, but the fact remained that by this time, more than half the NFL's teams had never been. Once again, it was the Cowboys' job to keep the riffraff out, but this time, the Falcons were no massive underdog. They were meeting the Cowboys at eye level. Just like their playoff game in Dallas two years earlier, the Falcons get off on the right foot with a field goal on the opening drive of the game before forcing a punt to get the ball back in Barkowski's hands. Soon after, speedster Alfred Jenkins torches the Cowboys, slipping behind everyone to haul in this 60-yard bomb that stakes the Falcons to an early 10-0 lead. This was one of about a million howitzer shells Steve Barkowski fired to Alfred Jenkins throughout their careers. Back when there was a greater speed disparity in the NFL than there is today, Jenkins' quickness could create enough separation to make a touchdown a foregone conclusion. He could also outmuscle opponents when going for the ball, despite his size disadvantage. He was listed at around 170, but when the legendary Lewis Grizzard sat down with him, he put him at closer to 150. Jenkins went undrafted out of nearby Morris Brown, just on the other side of I-20, and he had no real ambitions of playing pro football until a friend convinced him to try out for World League Football, one of many alternative leagues that tried and failed to compete with the NFL. After becoming arguably the best player in the entire 1.5 seasons of World League history, he caught on with the Falcons. A season from now, he'll rack up more than 1,300 receiving yards. Although the Falcons have fielded an incredible amount of talent at the wide receiver position, this record will stand all the way into 2008. But this is unquestionably the biggest game of his life. The Cowboys rally back to tie it on a nifty Danny White toss, but as halftime nears, Jenkins has more magic in him. With two defensive backs absolutely plastered on him, Bartkowski launches an impossibly tough bomb deep downfield that even leaves broadcaster Vin Scully completely dumbfounded. Oh God. Did he catch it? Yeah! I can't believe yeah. he caught it! That sets up a one-yard rushing touchdown to take a 17-10 lead at the break. Midway through the third quarter, that Falcon lead balloons to 14 when Bartkowski finds fullback William Andrews running a little angle route to beat the linebacker for the score. Atlanta maintains their 24-10 lead heading into the fourth quarter, and even though the Cowboys put together a drive to cut the deficit in half, the Falcons tack on a crucial field goal to make it a two-score game with just six and a half minutes left. Dallas is now in miracle-seeking mode, which means there's one player in particular the Falcons really need to hone in on. 
Cowboys wide receiver Drew Pearson. Pearson has already delivered the killing blow that clinched a couple different playoff wins over the Rams, including the very prior week. Oh, and he also knocked the Vikings out of the 1975 playoffs when, down four with less than a minute left, he caught a 25-yard pass to convert a 4th and 17 before hauling in the NFL's original Hail Mary. So the book is out. It's very well established that Pearson's gotta be the defense's focal point. If the Cowboys are gonna pull off a miracle, it simply can't be because the Falcons let themselves become the latest notch on Pearson's belt of playoff heroics. White immediately leads the team down the field with this dump off to Tony Dorsett breaching the red zone. The next play, White drops back and with Atlanta's pass rush applying less pressure than the atmosphere at Everest Summit, threads a needle between three Falcons in the end zone toward a leaping Pearson who snatches the ball with 340 left to add to his postseason legacy. Fortunately, the Falcons had a multi-score cushion, so even though they're now only up three, if their offense can eke out just one first down, that'll be pretty close to the knockout shot. Despite Too Tall Jones's tap dancing routine on a third and short nearly gifting one, they do not. Taking over at their own 29 with just 148 to play, White once again has the Cowboys moving before a screen to Dorsett takes them all the way down to Atlanta's 23-yard line. The Falcons just gotta avoid allowing a touchdown, the only thing that will beat them. But with this movie of Pearson late-game postseason heroics having been seen over and over again, including just a few minutes ago, everyone in the state of Georgia is terrified of him right now. Everyone, that is, except Jerry Glanville, who opts for one-on-one -on -one coverage against the man who constantly rips out the souls of teams late in playoff games. He doesn't even bother to roll the safety coverage in his direction, so no help arrives until it's too late. He caught it! Touchdown! Ball game. And heartbreak. The Falcons have allowed themselves to become the latest notch on Pearson's belt. We'll be back, everyone said. Everybody in Atlanta expected that this was the beginning of something. But 1980 was the apex, not the start. It was as though the Falcons went up to the door of the establishment, knocked twice, and left after nobody answered. They fell to 7-9 and nine in 81, then sort of tripped and fell into the playoffs in the strike-shortened 82 season. The NFL hastily assembled an expanded postseason format to let more teams in as a way to compensate for the lost games, allowing a 5-4 and four Falcons team that finished the regular season with back-to-back -back blowout losses to sneak in. Not only did the Falcons get to play in the postseason again, but on wildcard weekend in Minnesota, they were actually spotted not one, not two, but three non-offensive touchdowns. The first was a blocked punt that Atlanta recovered in the end zone. The second was a fake field goal where kicker Mick Luckhurst tapped into his rugby roots to take this lateral to the house. And the third was a few plays later when safety Bob Glazebrook turned an errant pass into a pick six. Didn't matter. Their offense was utterly anemic and scored zero touchdowns. The Falcons were basically handed 21 free points on a silver platter in a playoff game and managed to squander it all away. Days after this game, owner Rankin Smith fired the only coach who had ever brought the Falcons to the playoffs. Smith pointed to the late season collapse and repeated what had long been a knock against Lehman Bennett that he was too reserved and easygoing, that his coaching style failed to keep his players motivated. At the press conference, Bennett was emotional. It was as though he could see the potential ahead of him, all the future conquests that would now go unrealized. Bennett was just 44 years old at the time of his firing, and his star quarterback was entering his prime. In hindsight, it's really tempting to wonder what the 1980s Falcons could have become whether they could have built on their success and challenged the NFL's elite. What happened instead was one of the most dramatic nosedives in modern NFL history. The 
Bennett's successor was Dan Henning, taking on his first ever head coaching job. He brought with him what was called the H-back offense, which put just one halfback in the backfield next to the quarterback. The idea being that the quarterback himself does more scrambling to extend plays, or even taking off and running. Barkowski loved it at first, but he was older now, and injuries were slowing him down. It just was not right for him. Henning clearly had to make a choice between his system and his quarterback, and he chose his system. A few games into the 1985 season, Steve Barkowski was benched. It was decided, it seems, that their 0-5 start was his fault, never mind his actual performance. Henning pointed to his tendency to take a lot of sacks. Well, yeah, you asked a dyed-in-the-wool pocket passer who was battling injuries well into his 30s to scramble for his life on a regular basis. But as a pure passer, he wasn't at all in decline. Through the first five games of 85, Bart's passer rating, a metric football insiders were well aware of back then, was third best in the NFL. In fact, of the 400 plus quarterbacking efforts of the post-merger era across such a span, he was way, way up there. He still had it. The Falcons had taken their star quarterback, the only great field general they'd ever had, and set him on the curb with close to a full tank. He played a handful of games to the Rams and then left the field for good. It wasn't easy to understand, but he spent the next few years going fishing and growing closer to his God. Who do you figure won that one? These are almost never stories about good people and bad people. Winning in the NFL isn't about drawing within the lines and hoping for the best. It's about picking a distant point, marching toward it, and accepting whatever comes of it. That's exactly what Henning did here, and it's what he'd do decades later in introducing the Wildcat formation to the NFL. It just didn't work out this time. But this is another opportunity to wonder what might have been. Bart had always found the most success standing in the pocket and chucking bombs. In what may have been the last gasp of the first great era of Falcons football, Barkowski faced off against Joe Montana's 49ers, a team headed precisely in the opposite direction. Down three points at midfield with two seconds remaining, the Falcons ran Big Ben left, the deep ball, their favorite play for breaking opponents' hearts over the years. Barkowski throws one of his last great missiles into the horizon. It bounces off his intended target and right into the hands of elusive wideout Billy White Shoes Johnson. Johnson loved to dance the funky chicken in the end zone, and is recognized today as the foremost originator of the touchdown dance. But that's not in play this time, because he has to go to the ground and stretch for every last inch. After the game, several 49ers insisted that he was down before he crossed the goal line. And given how long it took for officials to make a call, they might have had a point. We're now watching one of the last moments of pure elation the Falcons will experience for years and years. It would be ages before they found another quarterback of Steve Barkowski's stature. Without him, Dan Henning's teams continued to stumble until he was fired after the 1986 season. In an early example of Rankin Smith's tendency to just bring back old friends he liked, he gave the job to Marion Campbell, who'd gone just 6-19 with the Falcons his first time around. His players always seemed to love him, but no matter what he did, he was powerless to stop what was, at this point, nearly a decade-long skid. Tired of all the losing, and unwilling to be fired by the same team twice, Campbell retired midway through the 1989 season and never returned to the NFL. The consequence of toiling in a lost era like this one is that your achievements will be forgotten by most. There's Gerald Riggs modeling that red Falcons uniform with the classic logo, far and away the sickest the Falcons have ever had. Riggs is still the all-time Falcons rushing leader as of 2021. Because he spent most of his career on a terrible team, you might have never even heard of him, but during the mid-80s, his rushing numbers were up there with the likes of Walter Payton and actually ahead of Marcus Allen. In even greater obscurity, there are center Jeff Van Note and tackle Mike Ken. Combined, these two started nearly 500 games for the Falcons, most of them in losing efforts. As offensive linemen who never once scored a touchdown, they have no highlight reels. Just like you never tell a bridge good job when you drive across it, their thankless pass protection is largely unappreciated by the layperson. Pro Football Reference does have approximate value, a method intended to roughly condense a player's contributions into a single number. There are a whole lot of very famous Falcons on this chart but way up at number two and number three all time are Ken and Van Note. I think these two are very emblematic of these more than 1980s Falcons. In order to truly understand these teams, you probably just had to be there. I wouldn't be surprised if the average football fan has not heard of any of these people. That is about to change, starting right now. It's the summer of 1982, somewhere in Florida. 
A 15-year-old is out in the suffocating humidity. His stepdad has dragged him out to pull weeds. On the chore spectrum, pulling weeds has to be among the very worst chores in existence, especially if you don't have the right tools, which, I mean, come on, he's some kid. I bet he's having to get down and pull them out with his bare hands. It absolutely sucks. The weather sucks. He's having a horrible time. This is the moment he makes a resolution that will alter his entire future. He has decided that he will never work another damn day in his entire life. 